Ok, buenos días, bienvenidos y bienvenidas a una nueva actividad del Festival Ciencia Puerta de Ideas de Antofagasta 2021, presentado en conjunto con Escondida BHP. Mi nombre es John Ewer, soy biólogo y a continuación eh, tendré el gusto de conversar con la neurobióloga molecular estadounidense Leslie Bosfold, que ha realizado importantes contribuciones en el cambio, campo del olfato con el descubrimiento y posterior caracterización de la familia de receptores olfatorios de insectos y por la base genética del comportamiento quimiosensorial en mosquitos y en humanos. Los invitamos a ser parte de esta conferencia donde Leslie realizará una fascinante exploración por el mundo de los aromas y el sentido del olfato humano. Very good. Well, Leslie, it's a pleasure to see you again. I'm sorry that it's so virtual, but it's great that you are participating in this festival. Um, as an introduction for everyone, Leslie has been uh, involved in the center of discovering, making important contributions to the discovery of two important, very mysterious senses. One is the sense of time, how the biological clock works and controls our sleep-wake cycles, for instance, but in general organizes all our behavior. And then later in the mysterious sense of smell, how it is that animals, not only humans, but all animal sense smells. And that's the center of her talk today. And I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, Leslie. Gracias, John. And I apologize that my Spanish is so terrible. So I will be giving this talk in English. So a world of aromas. I'm going to walk you through what we know and what we don't know about the sense of smell. And there's much more that we don't know. And I'm going to start by just showing you what it's like to perceive a smell. This, these are pictures of an advertisement from the Yves Saint Laurent opium perfume. So you see a woman touching a perfume bottle. She now touches the beautiful glass lid of the bottle. She touches it to herself and you can see the emotion in her face and the intense pleasure of smelling this perfume, all of the evocative emotions that she's feeling. And we know very little about how touching this little piece of glass with chemicals on it leads to these emotions. What I can tell you is that inside that bottle is a recipe, a mixture of these 72 individual chemicals that are mixed together. And so this is a huge mystery. How can you mix together 72 chemicals and evoke these strong, pleasant emotions? And what I'll tell you today is a series of findings that scientists have made about all aspects. What is a smell? What is it composed of? What kinds of emotions do smells trigger in people? How does the nose detect those chemicals? How does the brain take the detection of the chemicals and put that together into an emotion or a sensation of some kind? And then I'll tell you a little bit about how COVID-19 affects the sense of smell. So here's just examples of the things that we work with as olfactory scientists. So each of these are drawings of molecules that are some of the 72 ingredients in that perfume. And this is the first mystery where if we look at these molecules, unless you're a smell chemist or you have a good memory, there's no way to determine what these molecules actually smell like. And so this is the first of the many mysteries of the sense of smell. This woman smelling a cup of coffee, you can't see the smells. We know that there's hundreds of smells in the coffee. How is her nose and her brain computing that it's a cup of coffee? So if we turn to vision, vision is simple. If you look at color vision, we can tell exactly that the wavelength of light will determine what the color of the light that we see. And so there's a really simple relationship between the wavelength of light and how it's perceived. And I'm really sorry that I can't be there in person for this festival, which I understand takes place here, this beautiful landscape where if you uh, ask what are, are the wavelengths of light of these different aspects of this natural scene, 
a scientist could basically color it in and tell you exactly what you'll see. So there's a very simple relationship between the uh, actual stimulus and how it's perceived. If we go now to another sensory system, which is the, the sounds, the hearing sense, those of you who are knowledgeable about music, someone who is able to write musical notation can indicate exactly what the music should sound like. And that's because the ear is able to translate the frequency of an auditory stimulus to a pitch. And that's why if you're a trained musician, you can, you can look at a piece of sheet music and sing what is being written. And that again suggests that there's a very simple relationship between the frequency of the sound um, and the pitch that we hear. And so in contrast, it's very mysterious how you go from this list of many, many chemicals to produce the things that we smell. So going back to this woman and her cup of coffee. So although you see the steam rising from the cup, so somewhere in that steam are hundreds and hundreds of molecules. For us to be able to smell them, they have to be light enough that they can go into the air and enter our nose. And so these are examples of some of the chemical structures of molecules that when you have a hot cup of coffee, they were released into the air. And interestingly, each of these molecules in isolation has a smell like flowery or sweaty or chocolatey or mushroom-like or buttery. But when you put them all together, you get a beautiful, rich, roasty cup of coffee. So this tells you that the brain is able to take in all of these smells that the nose has inhaled and somehow put together a picture of what has been smelled. And we understand almost nothing about how this works. Another amazing thing is that we have this enormous capacity to smell a vast number of different smells. And that experiment is done every day at uh, perfume houses where there are chemists working every day to make new molecules, new chemicals, to try to expand the kinds of ingredients that you can put into perfumes, as I showed you for the Yves Saint Laurent opium perfume. Now they're in their labs making molecules that have never existed on earth. So humans have not evolved to smell these molecules because they have not existed before. And nevertheless, we and the perfumers are able to smell these smells. So it tells you something about the nose and the brain that we are pre-programmed um, as animals on earth to smell a vast array of different molecules, even those that we have never experienced before. And this phenomenon guided the search for trying to understand how we smell smells, what is in our nose that's allowing us to smell everything that exists on earth and everything that may exist on earth if a chemist makes it. So again, back to this question of how can you predict what something will smell like? So here's some molecules. I know that one of these is violets and one is cinnamon and one is chocolate and one is grass and rose, but you have to memorize it because there's no way to go from the chemical structure to the odor, unlike, as I mentioned, that the wavelength of light will tell you what the color is that you see and that the frequency of the sound will tell you what the pitch of the sound is. So what kinds of things can we perceive about smells? So first of all, intensity, very trivially, just like with sound, if you have a, if you have a strong sound or a strong smell, you perceive it as strong. If you have a lot of roses, the intensity will be very high. So the smell system does that. It can tell you, is there a lot or a little? The olfactory system is also really good at telling the difference between different smells. Roses may not be the best example because plant breeders have made roses increasingly odorless. But if you go somewhere where there are wild roses, you can tell differences between even different roses on the same plant produce subtly different odors. And so we're very good at telling those odors apart. Finally, my most exciting thing here is pleasant or unpleasant. For me, my motto, my daily motto is there are no bad smells, but most people disagree with me. So most people have this idea that there are pleasant and unpleasant smells. So at the left is a rose. Most people find a rose pleasant. At the right is a plant that gives off a smell of rotting dead meat that the flies really like. The flies are attracted to the scent of that flower and they lay their eggs in the flower. Most people smelling that flower will smell rotting meat and will find it unpleasant. 
So again, smell covers all of the different emotions that humans might have. Sexy smells, delicious smells, evocative smells, or disgusting smells. So, and we interact every day with smells like food smells or beverage smells. If you wear perfume, you interact with perfume smells. And you also interact with body smells because we all give off unique body odors. I'm from the United States where we have crazy people and crazy television. And so here's um, a woman uh, who has become addicted to the smell of her baby's dirty diapers. Most people find uh, dirty diapers incredibly unpleasant. To this individual, she has decided that dirty diapers smell incredibly pleasant. So something about her experience of having a new baby to her is the most pleasant thing on earth. And so this gets to this idea that how you perceive odors is very, very much tied into your experience and your culture. And so at the bottom left is a picture of the durian fruit, which is a very, very prized fruit in Asia that to people in the West smells disgusting, like vomit or rotting cheese. And in Asia, that smell is, is beautiful. So they love the fruit. At the top right, conversely in, in Europe, these very, very smelly cheeses that are objectively, they're rotting. They're full of fungus and bacteria. In Europe, in France, this is a cheese that people will pay enormous amounts of money to eat. In Asia, this is considered disgusting. And then at the top left, garlic is a very polarizing smell. Some people find it disgusting. And at the bottom right, cilantro, coriander, a fresh herb. You can divide the world in half into people who hate cilantro and those who love cilantro. And that is a combination of the genetics of the person and the culture and experience of the person. At Rockefeller University, we've run thousands of people, volunteers through our smell studies to try to understand how humans interact with smells. And so here's a subject who's picked up a smell vial and you can tell from her expression that she finds it very unpleasant. In contrast to the woman who was smelling the opium perfume, she found that very pleasant. So another interesting fact about the sense of smell is that the exactly same molecule can smell beautiful at a low concentration and disgusting at a high concentration, unless you're like me and I think all smells are great, there are no bad smells. So indole and scatole are odors that you find in jasmine and orange blossoms that at low concentrations smell like jasmine and orange blossoms, as you increase the intensity of the smell, it smells like excrement, human or animal excrement, which most people find unpleasant. Another way that we think about smells is categories. If you look at these pictures, uh, you can see that each of these relates to different aspects of our daily lives in the environment, tobacco, citrus, flowers, chocolate. And so what perfumers do is, we'll use something like a floral category, all of, all of these things that are released by flowers. But again, we're able to discriminate very readily the smell of a lily, a jasmine flower, a rose, and a violet. And all of this is due to the different odor molecules that these flowers release and the incredible ability of our nose and our brain to tell the difference between them and put them into categories. And unlike other senses, where if you ask someone to describe a picture, if you have a picture of that Atacama desert and you ask someone to describe it, it will not be difficult for them to say, I see a mountain, I see a sky, I see a body of water, it looks dry. When you ask people to explain what they're smelling, they cannot put the words to it because it seems to be an inaccessible, really primal emotional experience. And so what we do in the field is try to come up with lists of words that people can consult to tell us how they're feeling about a smell. But what's also interesting about this is that, that smell is very deeply cultural. And so this was a list that was developed in the United States in 1985. And if I give this list to my 18 year old daughter in 2021, about 20% of the words, she has no idea what they are. So what is carbona? What are mothballs? What is kippery smoked fish? She has never experienced these things. If you take this list to some other part of the world, they'll say, what is peanut butter? Because that's a sort of deeply American substance. And so these lists of words are another 
it's kind of exposes the difficulty of thinking and talking about smell is that we don't have the words to describe what we're perceiving. So what happens when we smell a smell? So this involves a collaboration between the scent, so the flower at the left, we must sniff to inhale the scent. So it goes into our nasal cavity and then it acts on smell neurons. So cells that are sitting at the very top of our nasal cavity that will detect these different smells and begin making decisions about what smells are present, what are the molecules and how much, what are the chemicals that are there? Do we have a lot of scatol or a little bit of scatol? And then that information goes up to the brain to say, okay, very little scatol, it must be a jasmine flower, a lot of scatol, it must be a pile of excrement. And so this is what happens if you look inside your nose. So looking with a microscope, you'll find here in blue and red, these are the neurons that are sensing the chemicals that give us the perception of a smell. And they are colored red and um, blue because they are molecularly different. So they will be responsible for smelling different smells. And then surrounding these cells, you can see here in this picture is one of these olfactory neurons sticking up outside um, of the sheet of cells, waving around these olfactory cilia, which are trying to find odor molecules. And wrapping these neurons to protect them are cells called support cells. And so they nurture these neurons and keep them alive and keep them refreshed. And that's important because the sense of smell, which most people view as the most uninteresting and least important sense, has become very important since January 2020 when the pandemic descended on the globe. Because one of the most reliable ways to diagnose that you have been infected and are suffering from COVID-19 is you suddenly lose your sense of smell. And so this is a very common symptom that people have even before they test positive. And so many scientists have tried to understand why are people losing their sense of smell? And the good news is that in many cases, the sense of smell comes back. And so this is just a, a picture of our current understanding of how the sense of smell is being disrupted by SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so in green are the support cells and the support cells have the receptor protein that allows the virus to enter. So SARS-CoV-2 goes into those support cells, replicates to high numbers, kills the support cells, and then that will kill the olfactory neurons. And so that's why you very rapidly lose your sense of smell because the nurturing cells die and then the neurons, because they aren't getting nurtured, die. But the good news is that there are stem cells um, at the base of the olfactory epithelium and so for most people, three, five, 12 months, those stem cells will renew and they will give birth to new olfactory neurons and those neurons will allow you to smell again. So how do we build a way for those neurons to sense all odors? And I'll remind you that in, in color vision, in our retina, we're able to see millions and millions of different visible colors with only three genes. So three photoreceptors that allow us together to see all colors. But the problem, as I've said a couple of times, is that there's probably millions of different smell molecules and it's not clear how they relate to each other. And so the idea that guided the hunt for how does smell work was this idea that we have to have many more than three receptors for smells. And this problem was solved in 1991 by Richard Axel and Linda Buck, who won the Nobel Prize for this work in 2004. And what they discovered is that there are, at least in humans and in, in rats and dogs and all animals on earth, genes called odorant receptors that allow us to smell all of the smells that exist on earth now and all smells that will exist in the future. And so humans have about 400 of these receptors that will bind to different combinations of odorants. And that combination idea is really critical. If you only had 400 odorant receptors and all of them bound one smell, you would be able to smell 400 chemicals. And a cup of coffee has 400 chemicals in it. And we know that you can smell more than coffee. And so the whole key to the ability to smell everything that exists on earth now and anything that will ever exist on earth 
is to have receptors that are in a combinatorial way able to smell many, many different things in different combinations. And so this works like this. You have about 400 odorant receptors and they end up being kind of like a keyboard where you play activity into these receptors and then the brain can read out the activity. So here's just an example of how the combinatorial code allows us to smell everything. So if you have this picture of 400 circles, each one is an odorant receptor. If you're smelling nothing, if you have an odor-free room, they're quiet, nothing is being smelled. If you have the smell of vanilla, you may activate a handful of these receptors, but some are activated very strongly. Others are activated a little bit and others are activated weakly. And so this could be the code for vanilla. Alternatively, you could have the smell of jasmine, which has scatol and indole in it. You probably will activate many, many more receptors. And then if you increase the concentration to have more of this jasmine odor, you'll activate additional receptors more strongly. And you can look at this matrix of 400 dots and realize that if you can color them in with different levels of intensity, with different combinations, you can probably smell more smells than there are molecules in the known universe. And so this is the incredible power of the nose to be able to smell many things. So what happens after the smells go into the nose? I talked about these smell neurons that are nurtured by the support cells. They send connections up to the brain where they begin talking with cells in the brain that begin to interpret what is the smell and how much of it is there. And so we made a cartoon a couple of years ago, this animation of what we think is happening. So this is just a picture of part of the olfactory epithelium. Receptors are colored according, the neurons are colored according to the receptors they express. And if we focus here on the blue odor molecule, it will try to find a receptor like a lock and key to bind it. So it has a match to the yellow receptor and the blue and the red, but it doesn't bind the green receptor. And you can see that the yellow, the red, and the blue are activated to different extents. And so the brain is able to get this digital code of reading out the three different activity patterns to decide it must be the blue odorant. People have actually done this experiment in animals. So they've had this animal smell amyl acetate or peanut butter, this great signature American odor or carvone, another smell molecule. And you can see by the spots on the brain of this animal that the different smells activate different patterns of activity. And you can also see this phenomenon that as you increase the amount of the smell that the animal is smelling from left, very little molecule to the right, a lot more molecule, more of these spots light up. And so we think that the brain is using this combinatorial code to say what is being smelled and how much of it is there. And we know this has been said over and over again, everybody knows that if you smell a smell, you're standing somewhere, you smell a smell, and it pulls you back to a time 10, 20, 50, 70 years ago that you smelled as a child. So smell has this ability to reach deep into your brain and into your memories to do this. And it's in part because smell goes very, very rapidly from the nose to the circuits that encode emotions. So the amygdala here, abbreviated AMYG, amygdala is for fear and panic and arousal and anger. So there are smells that go there directly. Hip, hippocampus is for memories. And so all of these different brain areas are activated in different ways when smells are uh, coming into the nose. Here's a personal example. I'm at the center of the photo. This is my German grandmother at the right. I can still remember the smell of her house by just looking at this picture. And if I am somewhere and I smell that smell of her funny German plastic carpeting, I'm immediately brought back into this room in Northern Germany. And I'm, I'm sure everybody listening has had this sense of smell much more than a picture, much more than a piece of music is able to bring us back immediately into that place where we once were sitting next to our grandmother. So let's think about how humans are in smelling relative to other animals on earth. And so if you have a dog or you've watched uh, rats or mice, I live in New York City, we have lots of rats or mice running around in the city. These animals really live their life by the sense of smell, especially rats and mice are nocturnal. They do all of their hunting for food at night. 
And what's graphed here in this plot, the black bars indicate the number of odorant receptors that these animals have in their DNA. And so you can see opossums, mice, rats, and dogs have between 800 and 1200 distinct odorant receptors. And then you look all the way at the right, humans have 400. So we have substantially fewer odorant receptors than these other animals for whom smell is likely to be a much more important way that they find food and survive. If we then look at the nose of a bloodhound or a typical dog that's not a bloodhound, a rat or a human, you can see that dogs really are the champions of the odor Olympics. So bloodhounds and dogs have between one and four billion olfactory neurons, smell neurons. Humans have about 12 million smell neurons. And so we just have fewer cells that are able to sense odors and we have many, many fewer receptors. And so at the bottom left, you can see the yellow part is a huge part of the brain of the rat is dedicated to smell, that big yellow part. On the right, at the bottom right, you can see the humans has the tiny, tiny, very small part of its brain that is devoted to smelling. So humans are much more visual, much more auditory, much more tactile. And so smell is a bit less important to us as a species. However, we are still very good smellers. So this is just a list of different smell molecules and how sensitive we are. So, Dimethyl sulfide is a very smelly, rotten egg smell, and the sensitivity of humans is incredibly impressive. Um, moldy smells, urinous smells, violet smells, we're able to detect them um, at very, very, very low concentrations. And companies that deal with safety of cooking gas, of natural gas, of propane, will, will take advantage of this sensitivity by putting an odor into natural gas, into cooking gas so that humans can smell it because otherwise the gas is odorless. And so if you have a gas leak, there will be no way to detect it before you are asphyxiated or before it explodes. And so this is a day-to-day -day thing that we are using our sense of smell to avoid being asphyxiated or exploded by a cooking gas. So although humans don't have many odorant receptors, we still have 400 receptors. And if you make the combination, we're able to smell a vast number of odors. What's really interesting in getting back to this, I love cilantro or I hate cilantro dichotomy is that everybody has a slightly different set of odorant receptors. So in general, humans have 400 receptors, but if you look at the sequence of the DNA of those receptors, every human is unique. And this may explain some of the disagreements that you have in families where, although you're genetically related, there are still differences in your genes and this will change how you perceive smells. And so this is an experiment from Israel where they looked at the DNA of 91 different people times 26 of their receptors and everybody had a different set of receptors, which we think explains these inter-individual differences in how people perceive odors. And I'll give you an example of a study that we did at Rockefeller studying this molecule, which we call the man smell. So this is a testosterone breakdown product. If you are a pig, this is the sexiest odor on earth. And so this is an odor that male pigs secrete and that female pigs are very sensitive to. And so smelling the smell makes them sexually receptive to the male pigs. Humans also are able to smell this smell and men produce it in vastly larger quantities than women. It's a testosterone breakdown product. And so this is a volatile, smelly version of testosterone. Men produce more testosterone and so they produce more of this smell. And what's fascinating is that people disagree fundamentally about what it smells like. It smells different to different people. So some people find it sweaty and urinous, like a body odor smell. Others think it smells sweet or floral, and many people find it completely odorless. So about five to 10% of people on earth cannot smell this odor at all. And so at our lab in Rockefeller, we have been trying to figure out why that difference exists. And so when we ask our volunteers to smell vanilla, vanillin, most of them agree it smells like vanilla. They're able to put that word to it, or they call it sweet. In contrast, when we ask them to smell this man smell, the androstenone, 
you get descriptors that range from dead animal to cedar wood, to buttery, to chemical, to nail polish remover. So there's general disagreement about what it smells like. And through a lot of detective work, we were able to figure out that there's a single odorant receptor gene that varies between different people that explains a lot of these differences of opinion. And so this gene is called OR7D4. And if you have one broken version of this receptor, you will in general find androstenone to be less unpleasant. People like me who have two good copies, I find it very unpleasant. If you are missing one copy of the OR74 gene, you'll find androstenone less intense. I find androstenone extremely intense. I have two good copies of this gene. And then lastly, if we ask people to put words to these smells, people who are missing one copy of OR74 think that androstenone smells more vanilla and less sickening, whereas I think that it smells sweaty, rancidy, and uriny. And so this is a case where a single gene in the human genome, in our DNA, will determine how we will perceive the smell. And if this sounds familiar, it's because you're familiar with colorblindness, which is this idea that depending on what genes you have changes how you perceive colors. And I'm gonna end with this idea that smell is an important sense. And if you ask people, what happens if you lose your sense of smell? Does it affect your life? Andreas Keller in my group set up a Google poll online to ask people to tell him and his study group about what their life is like if they can't smell. And you can see here on the world map, all of the different people who responded to this poll, over a thousand people who had lost their sense of smell. And so loss of sense of smell affects many behaviors. First of all, eating. So food no longer tastes normal, doesn't have that, that beautiful smell. Person on the left here says it tastes like sawdust, cardboard, or paper. People eat spoiled food because they can't smell it. A person at the bottom right sprinkled paprika spice instead of cinnamon on her cereal uh, because she couldn't smell it. And the person at the bottom left gained a lot of weight because the food was tasteless and so she just kept eating and eating and eating. It also affects safety. We talked about this idea that if you have a natural gas leak in your house, you can't smell it. The woman at the left here had a dead rodent in her house that only her daughter discovered when she visited. Um, and the person at the bottom right didn't realize that her baby's diaper needed to be changed because she couldn't smell the smell of the dirty diaper. All respect to the woman who loves the smell of dirty diaper. And then lastly, because the sense of smell is so deeply tied to our emotions and our mood, if you lose your sense of smell, there are big effects on mental health. It affects how you interact with people um, and how you perceive the world. And so I hope in the last few minutes I've convinced you that number one, we know very little about the sense of smell. What we do know makes me excited as a scientist to continue pushing to understand how we think it works. And then lastly, that the COVID pandemic has put into focus how important the sense of smell is because now we have hundreds of thousands of people losing, probably millions of people, I've lost track of how terrible the pandemic is, losing their sense of smell because of this terrible virus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leslie. That was super. So you touched right at the end about the, like the emotional weight of a smell. And you, you hear a lot of people who lose smell, they feel like they've lost their soul or they don't belong places. That must be quite a different pathway from the one that allows you to smell vanilla or is it part of the same package? Like the fact you can't smell anything makes you feel not belong anywhere or have you lost particular lines that would be the ones that kind of give you that smell of that sense of belonging somewhere? Yeah, I think that the, uh, these, these emotional problems happen in people who have had a sense of smell in the past and then lost it suddenly. So I think that that's the key thing. So if you've had your whole life where you've mm -hmm. been able to smell after the rain, that, that smell, so you know that after it rains that there should be this beautiful smell. And because you've lost your sense of smell, you, can't, you don't detect anything. So I think it's that the memory of what once was 
will give you this sadness. If you're born without a sense of smell, then everything is different because you've never perceived it. And so I think the answer is it's a little bit of both because you know you don't sense the vanilla. And so then your brain is not telling you there's vanilla, but if there's other cues, like someone hands you a cake that you know should smell like vanilla and it doesn't, then that triggers you know, nostalgia and loss and, and sadness. So you don't think it's a particular line that- I don't think it's a particularly emotions. line. I mean, I think it depends that I think all of the smells go into the nose and then they all go into the, the first switching station of the brain. Um, and then things are very densely interconnected to memory. And you mentioned something about a particular line, which is like the, the, this chemical that triggers a response in pigs and that yes. you find yes. very offensive. That's a different category of smells too. It's like a, what we classify as a pheromone. Yes. Can you talk a bit about pheromones especially in humans, because I don't know that we pay any attention to those, but maybe you know of evidence that suggests that in fact, we do make decisions about partners and things like that using our olfaction. Yes. So pheromones are molecules that are produced by a member of one species that will communicate something to a member of the same species. And pheromones are mostly known for sexual communication. And it's very controversial in people, but uncontroversial in animals. So we know that a, 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 a female moth will produce a pheromone and it lures males very strongly. Just we know what the molecule is, it lures them, it causes them to be sexually interested. We know in mice and in pigs, one molecule will lure the male or lure the female. For some reason in humans, it's still controversial. I think part of that is it's difficult to study. It's very easy to, uh, to do sexual experiments with pigs and mice. It's much more difficult to set up an ethical experiment where you try to study sexual arousal or sexual behavior without crossing a line. Uh, that said, there's good evidence from Noam Sobel in Israel that there's a substance in our tears. So when we cry, he's able to collect the substance and that substance, we don't know what the chemical is, but it can impact emotion. So he can take those tears and offer the smell of the tears to men and it will change their behavior. And so that's a sort of a hint that of course humans have pheromones. We just haven't figured out a way to really figure out what the molecule is and convince people they exist. But humans are animals. So I think, mm -hmm. I think that when you meet someone there probably is something like love at first smell, right? We use our visual, we use our cognitive, but it seems very likely that the smell of a person also is involved. You probably read that book, the, the Perfume, I think it may be called in English. It's about this fellow in the 18th century who distills the scent of, a, of beautiful women. Uh, that's a spectacular book and it hints at this idea of like a, some kind of a pheromone that makes people love you in this case. Yeah, so. it's a very famous book, very important in our field. And we've all experienced this. So if you have a sense of smell, like the fresh baby smell, the old person smell, the, the smell of someone that you love, people always report, you know, I knew that I was going to divorce my husband because I stopped liking his smell, right? It's a, I, <laughs> people tell me this all the time. <laughs> tell me who you, what you smell like. You touched about a bit about the other problem when you lose smell is that things don't taste. So what's the, what's the relationship between taste and smell? Yes, great question. So, and, and uh, when, I, when you hear the press coverage of COVID-19, they'll say, oh, the person lost their sense of taste, but that's not true. So when we eat something, most of the reason that it tastes good is through our sense of smell. So if you put food into your mouth as you're chewing it, there's a sort of a backward pathway where the chewing of the food in your mouth actually pushes the smell of the food into your nose from the retronasal pathway. And so because of COVID is killing off all the smell neurons, when you're chewing on the food in your mouth, the, the pathway of the nose is dead temporarily, we hope. And so all you're getting is the taste of the food. And we know that there's sweet, sour, bitter, uh, oh my goodness, sweet and umami. So there's only, there's only a, a, a set of qualities um, of the food that is taste. Taste is pretty simple, but what mm -hmm. makes a cup of coffee or a glass of wine delicious is the smell. And so when you're, when people say I, I lose my sense of taste or smell, it's usually that you've lost your sense of smell 
and then things taste terrible. Right, and you can eat something disgusting by holding your nose, which doesn't make sense, but that's exactly because right, you get exactly. rid of the smell. And yeah. and and everybody, um, you know, if you if you get a, a cold and you very temporarily lose your sense of smell, then food, you know, food really does taste like nothing. Right. Cool. And now thinking about how you move forward in this world of mysteries. Um, you've worked with lots of different organisms that have different smell capabilities, including now mosquitoes that smell things that we don't really consider smells like a smell of carbon dioxide and things like that. So can you tell us a bit about how you're moving from humans to other organisms and, and why you would move to those organisms and, and what you learn from them? Mm -hmm. whether it's useful to humans or useful in general to understand how this sense of smell works. Yeah, so I started my lab about 20 years ago when we started uh, working first on flies, the model organism that you're famous for working on, and humans. And about 10 years ago, I shifted to the mosquito, Aedes aegypti, which infects hundreds of millions of people with dengue, chikungunya, yellow fever, and Zika every year. And it's easy to intersect my human smell interest with the mosquito smell interest because mosquitoes hunt humans. Mm -hmm. Mosquitoes are attracted to humans because of the smells we give off kind of back to the pheromones. And so we've made discoveries about the kinds of molecules that humans give off, the kind of smell molecules that humans give off that make female mosquitoes very interested in us. And the overall goal of that work is to stop female mosquitoes from doing that. You know, what can we do as humans to be less delicious to mosquitoes? What substances can we put on our skin to make us repellent? And, um, and why and how is the mosquito hunting people? So that's, that's really the majority of what, of what we're doing right now. And what things have you learned about the way mosquitoes smell that you would never have thought about if you just studied humans? Yeah, so I think the, it, it does make you realize that the biology is so rich with, with different ways of looking at the world. So mosquitoes are very, very attracted by carbon dioxide. And every time you exhale, you will um, put out 4% carbon dioxide. And if you stand next to someone, you can't smell that. You know, if you're standing very close to someone, you don't smell the carbon dioxide. But if you're a mosquito, you can smell that carbon dioxide from several hundred meters away, just a little, little bit of carbon dioxide. So that's a capacity that the mosquito has that humans don't have. And then moreover, we take a little bit of the scent of this part of the arm right here which is odorless to us, we don't smell anything. If you haven't put perfume on, it's odorless, but a tiny amount of that smell will attract hundreds of mosquitoes. And so this is another aspect where they are able to perceive things that we can't perceive. And I find that to be profound because they, are, they specialize in hunting us. And so they've, they've really built up everything over evolutionary time uh, to do that one job, which is to find us and bite us. And there's another interesting aspect of that, that only the females do the hunting, true? This is a really important thing, yes. So the, um, which you see the same thing in human smell. So, so female humans are in general much better smellers than, than male humans. So we, we have that, that, that differences between the sexes. And it's absolutely true that only female mosquitoes bite people. And so we're very interested in this idea of what is happening in the brain of the female mosquito that makes her pay attention to people, to be motivated to hunt them and to be motivated to land on their skin and bite them and, and drink their blood, something that males aren't able to do. And we did an experiment a couple of months ago that was published where we changed the rules. So we feminized male mosquitoes. We took away a single gene called fruitless and we made male mosquitoes that all of a sudden were very interested in people. And this tells you something that, that somewhere in the male brain, there, there is probably the capacity to act like a female. And, and this one gene is standing in the way that makes you male or female. And of course, the people that heard about this work said, well, this is exactly the opposite of what we need you to do. The last thing we need you to do 
is to take the other half of all mosquitoes on earth and make them hunt people. So they said, well, come back to us once you've, you know, masculinized the females and made them not interested in, in people, which is a harder experiment, but they have a good point. Oh, but that could be like the male sterile exactly. approaches that are used to control other insects. Exactly. Hmm. And, and how, given that this is the year of the Nobel Prize that was given for the technique that you use, can you take advantage of this opportunity to tell us a bit about how you did those experiments because the mosquitoes are small and, and no one really un understands how you would ever do something like that. Yes, absolutely. So the, uh, this CRISPR technology that was born in 2013 and was the subject of the, I guess, 2020 Nobel Prize, although I've forgotten what 2020 was. So- uh, <laughs> It was canceled. This, this technology allows <laughs> Any biologist, whether you're a plant breeder or you want to cure a human genetic disorder or you're like us, you want to understand mosquitoes, we are able to use CRISPR to make designer mosquitoes. And so that's how we made a male mosquito that likes the smell of humans by very, very simply, it's a simple experiment where you um, basically inject the, this CRISPR technology into mosquito eggs. And when they grow up into adult mosquitoes. We've um, altered their DNA and then we just breed those animals and then they'll grow up to be feminized males that will hunt people. And so that really has been a revolution in biomedicine. That's touched every aspect of biology. As I said, from plant breeding, um, it's definitely the future of human clinical practice to, to try to cure, uh, cure uh, human genetic disorders. And then for us, basic scientists or people trying to fight mosquitoes, CRISPR is everything. And what, what other sort of biological questions could you approach regarding olfaction in, in other species that have some interesting feature about their olfaction, like maybe they're good trackers or maybe they use it a lot more for hunting, but finding particular prey or things like that. Are there, are there other because with this, you could really choose the animal that has an interesting question because you have many more tools now to study them. That's absolutely true. And I think that modern biologists are, they're very much guided by the questions and CRISPR made it possible to, to really do your dream experiment. So I think a recent example was that there's really terrible locust infestations mm. in Sub-Saharan Africa. So locusts, these crazy biblical insects that aggregate and form angry swarms and then fly and denude all of the vegetation, just wipe out all agriculture in a, in a region. And so uh, Le Kang's group in China used CRISPR to really show how they're doing that. I mean, that's, it's a miracle. So it was, it was noted in the Old Testament, right? The, it's an Old Testament idea that this happens. And so then in 2020, Le Kang and his coworkers figured out how it works. And we talked about the moths that have that hunt with pheromones. There's so many opportunities to take specialist animals um, and try to figure out how their brains um, are able to do these amazing things. And do you have any favorite in mind? Well, I mean, we're not done with the mosquito. I'm still trying to understand uh, what's going on with the mosquito. I think ants and honeybees are incredible. So mm. honeybees are incredibly smart they are able to they they see colors in ways that we can't so they're able to see outside of that visible spectrum where we can see colors nobody understands how that works um, ants i mean social insects are incredible of all, all the different societies that they build many of them are built on on smells and pheromones yeah. it would be nice to be able to experience a smell like a real like a dog does. It's just, when you see them behave, it's like they can see color and you see the world in black and gray. It's such a vivid experience for them. It's unbelievable. There was a chapter, I remember maybe you read it, Oliver Sacks book, uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, yes. I think, where there's a fellow who, I think it's called The Dog Under the Skin or something like that. And the fellow can smell people like minutes before they arrive and so on. Is that, do you think it's a disinhibition of something or that person just expressed many, many receptors and something went crazy there? Because the, the effect then went away, I think, but, but for a time he could smell like who was coming down the street. Which is amazing. And you, it's true. You, you just need to spend a few minutes with a dog to realize mm. 
how they're, they perceive a completely different world than you. You're, you're walking next to a, a street lamp and you see a street lamp and smell nothing, but they're able to extract all this information about which dog was there, how many dogs were there, was the female ovulating, uh, was the dog old or young? And so it's, it's humbling to see how they do it. To the Oliver Sacks example, I have no idea. I think that this happens frequently where people have an olfactory illusion where they smell burning toast constantly mm. that, that, that can last for a couple of months where something has been miswired, where they have this olfactory hallucination. There is no burned toast in the house, but they have this percept. So that would be a guess, this, this can happen. It's quite frequent where people have these, some, because the neurons in the human nose are constantly being reborn, a little bit like your skin is, is constantly turning over and sloughing and new skin grows. The, the cells in your nose are constantly regrowing and rewiring. And so one idea might be that there's been some crossed wires where the, you know, a normal smell gets wired into the burnt toast pathway. And so you're just always smelling burnt toast until those neurons die. And then things return to normal and you would only activate the burnt, the burned bread, burnt toast pathway when there's actually burned toast. So um, I think all of these experiences really, if you go back from those experiences, help you figure out what the mechanism is, what's the scientific explanation. Um, right. There's a thing that, that you touched upon that seems incredibly mysterious to me is that the neurons get renewed, but the smell doesn't get renewed. So you don't, you're not aware that your neurons are being renewed because there's a constancy in the smell. So it's violet still smell like a violet. That means that you, if the neuron dies, which it does, I think once a month, the smell persists. So there's a constancy. Yeah. It's really strange amazing because the neurons die so how is any is much known about that process we're just starting to understand that but you're absolutely right that even in the case of covid where all of the neurons die overnight everything dies it's just like you've killed everything and then over the course of the next three to four to five to twelve months all all of the neurons are new they have no experience smelling anything but they're connecting to a deeply experienced brain. So the brain is keeping a memory of my grandmother's plasticky German carpeting. And so we don't really know how that works, but for sure the memory is being held in the brain. It's just, it's waiting for the nose to reconnect. And then the rules of those reconnections are still mysterious, but, but you're able to kind of plug everything back into the wall, into the brain, and then it just works again. And mm -hmm. And you're also right that it's turning over all the time, but we're not aware of it because there's redundancy. So it's only in cases like COVID-19 where everything dies overnight that you really um, experience from one day to the next, you lose everything. So there must be receptors in general for many, many things that are born and then you figure it out later because they're being born and they have whatever receptors they have, but the, the constancy of the smell persists. That's really yeah. amazing. So that's the case also for COVID-19. It's uh, absolutely, yeah. Wow. It, 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 th things return to normal. So they're able to make those judgments I talked about. Is it strong? Is it weak? Is it pleasant? Is it unpleasant? It hasn't changed yeah. there. And things are appropriate. You give them you give them a you know, cookie with vanilla in it, they'll say it's vanilla. So ah, somehow- That's reassuring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's good, yeah. And the last question I have of biology is, uh, what about animals that are underwater? Do they smell or do they taste? Or is it both like a mammal that lives underwater? You know, there's a lot of scientific argument about it. I, I, fi I find it confusing also the way, you know, normally when you define smell as it's volatile, it goes up into the air. There's some evidence that, that, um, that fish have, you know, what looks like a taste pathway and a smell pathway, but because they're underwater, all, all of the smells are dissolved in water. So it's kind of a technicality. But is um, it a concentration thing too? Like I assume smells are much less concentrated or is that a simplification? I think that the, you know, in aquatic animals, you still have these two different taste like and smell like pathways that differ by the kinds of things that they, the kinds of molecules that they respond to. But it does, it does start to get a little hazy between which one is which. Whereas in terrestrial animals, it's very clear, right. like a tongue and a nose are very different. Right. And you have different thresholds, true. You can seem to smell almost nothing. 
but for the taste, you need a lot more. Absolutely. So sweet, you know, you really have to put a lot of sugar on your tongue to be able to, to taste the sweet. Mm. I think we're almost out of time. I wanted to ask you if it is a simple experiment that your, your listeners or your viewers can do at home that would bring home this idea of the complexity of smells and that we usually take for granted, but is like part of our everyday life that we don't necessarily pay attention to. Yeah. I think the easiest experiment you already mentioned, which is that if you take in the US, we have these candies called jelly beans that come in many, many different flavors and you chew on them. So if you get some sort of a chewy candy that has a flavor, ideally multiple flavors, so you don't know which one you're picking up. If you put it, if you hold your nose very tightly and then you put the candy in your mouth, hold your nose very, very tightly and chew. And, and then think about what flavor is it. And because your nose is pinched and, this, and the smells can't get up into your nose, you probably will taste sweet and sour, whatever the chemicals that are in the candy, but then you release your nose and then the retronasal pathway works and you'll say, ah, oh, it's raspberry. And so that's, I think the easiest way, you know, 10 seconds of chewing with your nose closed and 10 seconds of with it open will give you the power of the sense of smell because you can take it away and then get it back. Um, and that's where you've you identified see, what it is, sorry? And I guess if you see the color, you might switch the smell or not. Like if you see it's red, it'll be raspberry, but if you see green, it might smell more like apple. Is that right? So you also have input from other senses. There is also input from other sensors. And this is, there, there's a famous uh, experiment with a wine tasting school where French wine tasting students were given white wine that was, that was had red fruit oh. coloring in it. And of course they perceived it as they were tricked. They were easily tricked. Right. And with the soda bottles, you can do the same. Like you can take a clear soda and add colors and they taste all of a sudden like orange and, or like mint or whatever. It's just coloring. It's very cool. Absolutely. I, I think, I believe we're almost out of time. I wanted to ask you a, a final unrelated question. So it's, it appears to me looking at your career that you have sort of a, a Midas touch. So you did your PhD with Michael Young on circadian rhythms. And he, a few years later, won a Nobel Prize. And then you did a postdoc with Richard Axel and he also won a Nobel Prize. Is it the case that all the people that you interact with always end up winning a Nobel Prize? Uh, I mean, I'm so proud of the people that, that I worked with. They were terrific, they trained me well. And uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, to work you with these great people. Yeah, yeah, you certainly were. And you still kind of work in similar fields. I mean, Richard, Richard Axon's whole faction. Yeah. So that's super. Well, thank you very much, Leslie. It's been super to see you. I hope next time it'll be in person and we can go explore Antofagasta and the Salado de Atacama, which is like being on the moon or being on Mars. But for now, this I think is as good as it can get. And uh, thank you so much for participating in this festival, Puerto Ideas. And I'm gonna give a little blurb in, in Spanish now. And I just close and thank you very much, Leslie. And uh, muchas gracias a todos por acompañarnos. Y no se pierdan las próximas actividades de Puerto Ideas de Antofagasta. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie.